Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the British Royal Armouries, taking a look at a couple of the particularly cool experimental rifles they have in their reference collection, like this SREM, the Sniper Rifle Experimental Model, or as it, were, as it was later renamed the SREM-1, because there would be a couple, uh, couple others following it. Now, this is a World War II development. It is a bullpup, bolt-action sort of, single line repeating, it's not semi-auto, uh, manually operated sniper rifle, and it operates through basically the same mechanism as the Biza machine gun, where the pistol grip is the charging handle. So the way this all started was, first off, it was a product of the Czech design section. So uh, most of the countries in Europe that were occupied by the Germans had small arms development programs, and most of their engineers and designers were not really thrilled with the idea about working under German occupation for the Germans. And so when their countries were occupied, a lot of these designers fled over to England. So the British would end up with a Czech design section, a Polish design section, um, there was a Belgian design section with guys from FN, which would, by the way, eventually lead to the FN 49, part of which was, part of the development of which was done here in the UK. Anyway, this is a product of the Czech design section, and the original design intent was we want a sniper rifle that you can cycle without disturbing your sight picture. So, okay, so how do we do that? You can't really use a bolt action because typically your face is far enough forward that you, when you cycle the bolt, you have to move your head out of the way. They want to avoid that. So the idea appears to have been, ah, you know that uh, ZB machine gun, the, the uh, what was in Britain called the BISA, which is actually a Czech design. It uses the pistol grip as a charging handle. We could do that. Okay, well if we're going to lay that out, how would you set up the rifle so that the pistol grip can act as the charging handle, and the bullpup configuration kind of naturally flows from that? Because this is about your right length of pull. Uh, you can then pull the, the handle backward to cycle it. In theory, this all lines up and works. And so we first see this documented in March of 1944. And, well, let me just show you how it actually cycles and works. All right, so if we start with some controls, trigger is obviously the trigger. This little button right here is the bolt handle release. So you push that in, and you can then pull the charging handle back. That cycles all the way back to here, and then forward. If we look at that up top, I pull the release. And it's going to cycle back like that. This is a pretty simple two lug rotating bolt, so when I push it all the way forward it's going to come up to there, and then you can actually see the cam track right here. This pin is connected to the handle to cycle it forward and back. When the bolt hits the breech face here it's going to stop, and that's going to force this pin down that track. Maybe like that, to lock in place. Sorry, it's a little sticky and it's hard to do slowly. Now up on top of the rifle we have iron sights, combined with a pretty typical British style front sight, and we have this one ring machined into the receiver. Now the front ring, scope ring, would have been here. This was intended to be a scoped rifle, just with backup iron sights. Almost certainly would have used the number 32 scope, that's the same scope that the uh, number 4 Mark 1T sniper rifle used. That was also intended to be a scope on the Bren gun, although that never came to fruition, but it was basically a one, one item general purpose telescopic sight uh, for British infantry small arms. Unfortunately the scope mount is gone, um, so we don't have it. Oh, and we have a safety right here on the left side, and that just locks the trigger. This is very much intended to be fired from the right shoulder, so we have a nice offset cheek crest on the right side. In fact, if you look closely here you can see the seam in the wood and the pins that hold it in place. So they made a rather wide, honestly, stock with that cheek crest. Um, there was a rubber uh, recoil pad on there that has not, has not survived well, but it's still there. We can slightly disassemble this by removing this one cross pin at the back. Pulling that out allows me to open up the rear, basically, action cover. There we go, and that just lifts up well, like a car hood. 
With that open, I can open the bolt up and lift it right out of the gun. That gives you a little bit better view of the two locking lugs, the extractor. There's your cam track to lock the bolt. There is an ejector cutout right there in the bottom. And you may notice that this is a little small for 303 British. This is, in fact, chambered for 7.92mm Mauser. Which seems a little bit odd for the UK during World War II, but uh, it's worth noting that all of their uh, semi-auto rifle development was going on in 8mm. The BISA light machine gun, or BISA tank machine gun, was in production, was in use by the British military, chambered for 8mm Mauser. And I suspect that this was just uh, the natural choice for this experimental development uh, program because the ammo was in use, and there was a, a significant possibility that the British military would go to either 8mm or 30-06 as a temporary interim cartridge in the years after the war. Like, that was something they were anticipating. We can design guns, probably, we can design guns for one of these existing rimless cartridges and then easily convert them to whatever rimless cartridge of our own design we end up choosing to use. So that's why this is in 8 Mauser. There's really not a whole lot else to see down here. Um, the trigger is fixed to the gun or to the receiver while the charging handle moves. So if I pull down on the trigger you can see it's going to pull the sear down here, which will fire. This other piece is the ejector, so that gets pushed down when the bolt goes forward. When the bolt's coming back it lifts up, comes through that cut in the bottom of the bolt, and kicks the empty case out. And then this peg is what holds the bolt and cycles it back and forth. On the bottom of the gun you can see the track that this runs in, and you can also see this locking stud. So when the handle's all the way forward it's going to snap over that, and pulling this back just drops. The rear sight is basically just a Lee Enfield rear sight. It will lift up for long range use if you want to do that with it. And there's really nothing going on at the front end of the gun. We have a barrel band and fore end furniture reminiscent of the number 5 uh, Enfield along with a front sight that's reminiscent of the number 5. This was ultimately only an experimental project. So in 1944 uh, the British government commissioned 22 prototypes to be manufactured, and they gave the project to the Essex Engineering Works. Interestingly, this is a British company that actually made sewing machines. Now sewing machine manufacture isn't that uncommon from firearms companies. At this point in time often if a company made firearms they would also make sewing machines or bicycles. It's kind of analogous to how today a company that makes high-end firearms parts will often also make aerospace parts. It's because the manufacturing equipment and skill set for doing those two things overlap quite a bit. Today it's, it's aerospace and guns. At any rate, it is a little unusual that this project didn't go to one of the major gun companies, or more likely the small arms factory at Enfield, or one of the other Royal Small Arms factories, but probably this comes from the fact that this was sort of a long shot project, and frankly Enfield and companies like BSA were at this point very busy manufacturing lots of other things. So anyway, uh, 22 samples are commissioned by Essex Engineering Works, only two are ever made, and this is the only known surviving prototype. In 1945 the project was cancelled, because presumably this sort of thing probably wasn't working out as well as they thought. The whole idea of being able to make, to cycle the gun without disturbing your sight picture is kind of a red herring anyway. Even if you can keep your face on, you know, in play, in line with the scope, the the force and the, the vibration from cycling the gun are going to bounce you off target anyway, so I don't think you would actually gain anything practical from a setup like this. I suspect that's what the folks doing the testing discovered, and they just cancelled the whole project in 45. So only two made. Uh, we don't know where the other one is, if it still survives today, but this one is here in the British Royal Armouries collection. So a big thanks to them for giving me the opportunity to film this. If you want to know more about the SREM 2 or 3, because there were a couple other development programs that took place just in the years after World War II, well, the Keeper of Arms and Artillery here at the British Royal Armouries has conveniently written a book, Thornycroft to SA-80, about British bullprop rifles, and it includes all of the known information about the other SREM models, which, to be fair, isn't a lot, 
but they are both in here. So if you're interested in getting a copy, I'll have a link to it in the description text below. It's a cool way to help support the armories. Um, anyway, big thanks to them for the access. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.